The NASCAR Cup Series currently races on 26 different types of racetracks, and although at a glance many seem similar, the ways that they race are completely different. So today, using a combination of track-long history, recent history, and of course my objectively correct unbiased opinion, we're going to break down the worst tracks in NASCAR currently on the schedule. Starting us off at number 5 on our list, we have Pocono. Honestly, I'm as shocked as you are that it's ranked this low. Pocono used to be the absolute worst track on the schedule in my opinion, but recency bias has me looking at this track a bit more favorably. Did the next-gen car revolutionize the racing at Pocono? No, not really, they still get painfully spread out and passing is definitely hard to do, but I think Pocono only having one race a year makes it a bit more stomachable now. And they've finally gotten some decent luck with the weather in recent years. For a long stretch of time, you just expected a rain-shortened Pocono race. If they ever made it to 400 miles, or oh god, they actually used to be a pair of 500-mile races, then it was considered a miracle. I myself have never been to Pocono, but I'm always surprised about all the positive things that people have to say about it. The campgrounds are among the best in the series, the track is quite beautiful, people seem to really like Pocono in person. Plus, Pocono has had some really memorable racing moments. Denny Hamlin with his back-to-back late-race fuse with Chastain and Larson. Ryan Blaney out-dueling Kevin Harvick for his first win in 2017. Bowman and Larson with an absolute dogfight in 2021 that ended with Larson cutting a tire in the last corner. Against all odds, Pocono has actually produced a number of really memorable moments in NASCAR history. And maybe I'm in the minority on this one, but I actually do enjoy the occasional fuel mileage race, which Pocono is usually the provider of. So while Pocono has been known to miss a lot, when it does hit, it hits pretty hard. Slotting in at number four is Indianapolis, the Oval to be specific. They tried to mix things up at the road course for the last few years, and I respect the move, but honestly, it's just not the brickyard when you're not on the Oval. And because of that, Indianapolis is a track that I think most of us have just learned to embrace the lackluster racing. It's not about the racing product, it's about the spectacle and the prestige of winning at the brickyard. Now, does that make the racing entirely excusable? Absolutely not. Which is why it's still on this list. Like Pocono, Indy has had some great moments, like Paul Menard's underdog fuel mileage win in 2011, Jeff Gordon winning in 2014, 20 years after the inaugural race, Jimmy Johnson sending it three wide while blowing up in 2017, and then wrecking almost immediately afterward, but dang it, it was cool while it lasted. But sometimes you end up with 2008 or 2020 Indianapolis, where random tire issues plagued the entire field. At the end of the day, Indianapolis is not a track designed for NASCAR racing, and as a result, NASCAR and Goodyear have had their fair shares of struggles with the racing product there. But it is the Brickyard, it is still a crown jewel, at least now that it's back on the Oval, and it makes for great storylines, so for that reason, I feel comfortable ranking it at only the fourth worst. Number three, Sonoma. I feel like Sonoma is the reason why road racing had a bad reputation for a long time in NASCAR. I mean, it certainly wasn't Watkins Glen's fault, we can say that for sure. Sonoma, for a long time, has just been known as that one road course that we have to go to. It usually kickstarts that summer slump part of the schedule that's never had any major importance, it's just kinda there. Sure, it's had good moments like Tony Stewart's last career win here in 2016, or Boyer vs. Kurt Busch vs. Tony Stewart in 2012, but more recent races have left a lot to be desired, especially with the next-gen car, which has been known to struggle at road courses. They've tried different configurations like the carousel and the chute, and it doesn't seem like either leads to particularly great racing. And looking at reporter Jeff Gluck's was at a good race poll, aside from 2016 with its amazing finish, almost every other Sonoma race in recent history ranks towards the bottom. Although, all of them have been won by Martin Truex, who is known for stinking up races on the regular, so maybe it isn't entirely the track's fault. Similar to Pocono, I have heard good things from fans that have been to Sonoma, though. I don't really know why, I would think that most road courses aren't great for spectating, but maybe it's just the scenery and the wine that people enjoy. I'm not sure. Also, it never rains, so I guess your tickets are pretty well protected. Well, it is a road course, so they could race in the rain anyway. Actually, rain might make the racing a lot better, and the track will be green and not dead and look a lot nicer on TV, so maybe we should move it up to earlier in the year. But yeah, more often than not, Sonoma just provides racing that I can only describe as... mid. Now we have so many better road courses on the schedule, and honestly, with the next-gen car, that's not really that much of a compliment. I know Sonoma has become somewhat historic to NASCAR, but it might just be the one road course that I can live without. Coming in at number two on this list is none other than Phoenix Raceway. Now, I'll freely admit this one is almost entirely recency bias. 
Looking back on Jeff Gluck's good race polls, I was actually very surprised to see how many Gen 6 Phoenix races ranked towards the top. Because I certainly don't remember them being that good. Although, if you ask Jamie McMurray, he said there hasn't been a good race at Phoenix since the track opened, and I am more inclined to agree with him. But yeah, Phoenix with the next-gen car has been mightily underwhelming, and honestly, the fact that this track now hosts the championship race just makes it all the more frustrating. Honestly, I could probably ignore most of Phoenix's faults, if not for the fact that it hosts the championship. It doesn't matter how good a season has been or how competitive the championship four is, because we know that Phoenix is looming over us at season's end, and it's probably not going to be that exciting. I'm also of the opinion that we shouldn't race twice a year the championship track anyway. I think that makes it feel way less special compared to Homestead since we only went there for the finale, but that's just my take. Passing has always been notoriously hard here, and according to Fox this past weekend, Phoenix apparently has the most overpowered first pit stall of any racetrack. Which means your champion could very well be decided by qualifying, and that is not a good thing. This track just falls into a weird gray area where races like both an intermediate and a short track, but lacks that short track bumping and banging, and lacks that competitive intermediate side-by-side -side racing. It feels more like the worst of both worlds. I know, the facilities are great and they routinely sell this place out for both races, so they must be doing something right, but as far as the actual on-track product, yeah, nah. But luckily for Phoenix, no matter how much it tortures us with lackluster finales, it can never commit the sins of number one on this list, Texas Motor Speedway. I don't even know why I bother keeping y'all in suspense. Most people just go ahead and pencil this one in at number one. Old Texas Motor Speedway certainly wasn't the worst. If anything, its worst offense was just being another forgettable copy of Charlotte and Atlanta. But once the track was repaved and reconfigured in 2017, Texas was never the same. In an absolutely mind-bogglingly bad decision, the banking was decreased in turns 1 and 2, leading to a much narrower racing line and significantly decreased passing. In addition to that, the track has been so heavily bombarded with PJ1, resin, and other compounds over the years, that the track now has areas that are completely untouchable. This actually affects IndyCar's ability to race at Texas far more than NASCAR's, but it's still pretty bad on both sides. Resentment for Texas only grew in 2021 when it stole the All-Star race date, and tempers from fans, drivers, and industry insiders all boiled over in 2022 when Texas delivered two of the most frustratingly bad races of all time. The 2022 All-Star race and 2022 Fall race both sit at the very bottom of Jeff Gluck's good race poll list, with 11% and 13% scores respectively. Apparently, Fox Sports went to both SMI and NASCAR and said that the 2023 All-Star Race needed to be held at, quote, any track but Texas. Which did lead to the resurrection of North Wilkesboro, so I suppose that is one thing we can thank Texas for. In the span of only a few years, Texas has lost its playoff date, its All-Star Race, its IndyCar Race, and the respect of millions of race fans. And now, many are wondering how much longer the track can survive in its current state. Maybe we're due for another reconfiguration soon, but until that happens, I can confidently rank Texas Motor Speedway as the worst current track in NASCAR. But hey, let me know, what do you think of the worst tracks in NASCAR currently? Be sure to leave a comment down below, like this video if you enjoyed, subscribe for more videos just like this one, and check out DailyDownForce.com for more awesome NASCAR content.